ಓಂ ಅಜ್ಞಾನತಿಮಿರಾಂಧಸ್ಯ ಜ್ಞಾನಾಂಜನಶಲಾಕಯ ಚಕ್ಷುರೋನ್ಮೀಲ ಯೇನ ತಸ್ಮೈ ಶ್ರೀಗುರವೇ ನಮಃ ಶ್ರೀಚೈತನ್ಯಮನೋಭೀಷ್ಟ ಸ್ಥಾಪಿತ ಯೇನ ಭೂತಲೆ ಸ್ವಯಂ ರೂಪಕದಾ ಮಹ್ಯಂ ದಾತಿ ಸ್ವಪದಾಂತಿಕ ವಂದೇಹಂ ಶ್ರೀಗುರು ಶ್ರೀಯುತಪದಕಮಲ ಶ್ರೀಗುರೂನ್ ವೈಷ್ಣವಾಂಶ ಶ್ರೀರೂಪ ಸಾಗ್ರಜಾತ ಸಹಕಂಡ ರಘುನಾಥಾನ್ವಿತ ತಂ ಸಜೀವ ಸಾಧ್ವೈತ ಸಾವಧೂತ ಪರಿಜನ ಸಹಿತ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಚೈತನ್ಯದೇವ ಶ್ರೀರಾಧಾಕೃಷ್ಣ ಪಾದ ಸಹಕಂಡ ಲಲಿತಾ ಶ್ರೀ ವಿಶಾಖಾನ್ವಿತ ನಮ ಓಂ ವಿಷ್ಣು ಪಾದ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಪ್ರೇಷ್ಠಾಯ ಭೂತಲೆ ಶ್ರೀಮತೆ ಭಕ್ತಿ ವೇದಾಂತ ಸ್ವಾಮಿನ್ಮಿತಿ ನಾಮಿನೆ ನಮಸ್ತೆ ಸಾರಸ್ವತೆ ದೇವೆ ಗೌರವಾಣಿ ಪ್ರಚಾರಣೆ ನಿರ್ವಿಶೇಷ ಶೂನ್ಯವಾದಿ ಪಾಶ್ಚಾತ್ಯ ದೇಶ ತಾರಿಣೆ ವಾಂಛಾಕಲ್ಪತರುಭ್ಯ ಕೃಪಾ ಸಿಂಧುಭ್ಯ ಪತಿ ಪಾವನೆಭ್ಯೋ ವೈಷ್ಣವೇಭ್ಯೋ ನಮೋ ನಮಃ ಜಯ ಶ್ರೀಕೃಷ್ಣ ಚೈತನ್ಯ ಪ್ರಭೂ ನಿತ್ಯಾನಂದ ಶ್ರೀ ಅದ್ವೈತ ಗದಾಧರ್ ಶಿವಾಸಾದಿ ಗೌರಭಕ್ತ ವೃಂದ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ 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 ಹರೇ 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 ರಾಮ ಹರೇ ರಾಮ 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 ಹರೇ 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 ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಐ ಆಮ್ ವೆರಿ ಹ್ಯಾಪಿ ಟು ಬಿ ಬ್ಯಾಕ್ ವಿತ್ ಆಲ್ ದ ಡಿವೋಟೀಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಭಕ್ತಿ ವಿದಾಂತ ಮ್ಯಾನ ಇಟ್ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಬೀನ್ ಅ ವೈಲ್ ಸಿನ್ಸ್ ಐವ್ ಹ್ಯಾಡ್ the pleasure and privilege of being with all of you i do hope that all of you are keeping well and safe i do not know what the situation of the covid pandemic is in the uk right now but i don't think you're completely free from it yet so i do hope that you are well and safe and taking the required precautions I also hope and pray that all of you are taking this opportunity to intensify your Krishna conscious activities your hearing chanting and other forms of seva I am also very happy that the current series of talks is on Srila Prabhupada as the founder acharya and an interesting way to understand uh, him as the founder acharya by speaking about uh, the past the present and the future so i think by now you've heard lectures on the past and the present right so who spoke on the past and the present okay so very nice he heard about the past of shila prabhu pad as founder acharya from shama sundar prabhu and about the present from akhandadhi prabhu so it is a tough act to follow for me following in their footsteps is not going to be easy their dedication their devotion their sacrifices and contributions to the movement have been immense and they speak from personal realization born of long years of service so it is a tough act to follow but nevertheless i shall attempt to do my duty so our topic today is shila prabhupad the founder acharya the future now before we actually get into the um, idea of what it means for prabhupada to be the founder acharya for the future i think a few words need to be explained or understood clearly for example the word acharya what does it really mean the word acharya from the point of view of etymology comes from the word acharan you know it's achara achara means behavior or conduct so from an etymological point of view an acharya is one whose achar or conduct is exemplary 
By the word exemplary, we mean that which is in accordance with the scripture, which is in accordance with Guru Sadhu Shastra. So anybody who whose conduct is in accordance with that uh, is called an Acharya, purely from the point of view of etymology. If from the point of view of usage of the word Acharya, one can speak of roughly three meanings. Traditionally, uh, in Gurukulas, when children uh, when they to study under different teachers, some of the teachers will be very young. In fact, the tradition has been that some of the older students become the teachers for the very younger uh, children. So, and then there are those who are older who also teach the older, older children. So, any teacher is called an Acharya. So, that is one meaning of the term Acharya. So, that was how it is traditionally been known in Gurukulas. So, even if the teacher was teaching, let us say, grammar or was teaching uh, some other subject, but it was called Acharya as a term of respect for the teacher. The second meaning of the word Acharya is more in accordance with the definition that I just gave of one whose conduct is exemplary and in accordance with Guru Sadhu and Shastra and one who has attained a certain level of spiritual development and that is a spiritual master. So the second meaning of the word Acharya is that is a spiritual master. So among spiritual masters also naturally there will be various levels. Those who are very, very exalted, those who may be not that exalted, but still who are pretty advanced, etc. But in general, the word Acharya means a spiritual master. Then when we speak of Acharya in the third sense, we speak of the most prominent Acharya, the Acharya which means the head spiritual personality. So traditionally in monasteries, for example, which are called mat in Sanskrit, um, there were heads. So they were called acharyas, acharyas of the mat. So we see that even in the Gaudiya Sampradaya after Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, he was the acharya of the mat that he founded. And even though he wanted a governing body commission to be formed after him, but somehow that didn't happen. And he, amongst his disciples, there were some splits and then different mutters were formed, different temples or muts were formed. And then there was an acharya of a mutt. So traditionally, the acharya of a mutt appointed a successor acharya, one person who would be the most prominent uh, spiritual personality, the head spiritual personality of that organization or that mutt. So in that sense, the word Acharya means the head spiritual personality. So these are the different ways in which we can understand the term Acharya. So when we speak of Prabhupada and we use the word Acharya, we mean not just a teacher, but of course Prabhupada is a teacher, but he's not just an ordinary teacher. He is an extraordinary teacher, he is a spiritually realized soul, therefore he is an ideal spiritual master and he is also the head spiritual personality, the head spiritual master, the head uh, teacher hmm, amongst all in our uh, association or community of devotees. So these are the ways in which we can understand Acharya. Now before we come to the word founder Acharya, Let's consider what the word Sampradaya Acharya means because uh, there could be some confusion between Sampradaya Acharya and Founder Acharya. So what is a Sampradaya? It's very important to uh, consider this. Now we know from Srila Prabhupada's teachings that uh, amongst the Vaishnava community there are four Sampradayas. One that starts from Lakshmi Devi one that starts from Lord Shiva, one that starts from the four Kumaras, and one that starts from Lord Brahma, the creator. 
and they have initiated disciplic successions and within their sampradaya within their disciplic succession and there has been branching so a disciplic succession or a parampara specifically is a succession of gurus and shishyas of spiritual masters and disciples now within a sampradaya there will be many such disciplic lines because let's say brahma brahma has a disciple and his disciple has many disciples each of those disciples will have many disciples so there will be many chains there will be a whole network like a tree that is formed starting from that original person who founded the sampradaya so they are the founders of the sampradaya so we can call them let's say the sampradaya the uh, sampradaya founders so ultimately of course it is krishna you know who is the ultimate founder of all sampradayas but it is he who has acted through these four personalities to start these four vaishnava sampradayas and within each of these sampradayas there are many disciplic successions many lines of spiritual masters and and disciples who then go on to be spiritual masters and they have their disciples and so on and so forth so therefore within each sampradaya there will be many networks or many successions of disciple and guru okay so broadly speaking these are the four um uh, founder sampradayas sampraday founders these four personalities and each sampraday actually is you could say a tradition in which a certain school of thought a certain philosophy uh, a certain tradition is handed down hmm? pradan sampraday the word da indicates to give as in dan so daya or dana so sampradaya sam means perfect or complete so sampradaya means that in which uh, transcendental knowledge from the supreme lord is completely and perfectly transmitted from generation to generation through the disciplic succession so there is a certain unity and integrity of the school of thought within that sampradaya therefore it has a distinct identity as a sampradaya so therefore these four sampradayas there is a lot of commonality between them uh, but there are some points of theological or philosophical distinction also so they have their own particular understanding of the supreme lord and of the process of bhakti and the practice of it so that is what the word sampradaya means so i spoke about who the sampradaya founders are then who are the sampradaya acharyas naturally the sampradaya founders uh, they are so important because they founded the sampradaya at the lotus feet of krishna but you see they are so far back in time they are so remotely situated in time and so distant from us uh that we do not actually have in a tangible sense uh connection with them in terms of their teaching their works except that their teachings have passed down through the sampradaya so there have been certain very eminent and exalted personalities in each of these sampradayas who have actually made that sampradaya very very prominent who have established the teachings and practices of that sampradaya on a very solid footing who have clarified everything very nicely who have established the systems and so on and these great personalities are called sampradaya acharyas so therefore in the brahma sampradaya brahma is the founder of the sampradaya but the sampradaya acharya is called madhvacharya from udupi similarly lord shiva or rudra is the founder of the rudra sampradaya named after him and in his sampradaya the sampradaya acharya is considered to be vishnu swami then the four kumaras they are the founders of the sampradaya named after them and the found the sampradaya acharya in that sampradaya is nimbarka acharya and then in the sampradaya founded by lakshmi devi shri 
the Sampradaya Acharya is Ramanuja Acharya. Now, what about us as followers of Srila Prabhupada? Where are we connected? Srila Prabhupada is connected naturally to, to via his spiritual master Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur all the way up to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and that is why we are called Gaudiya Vaishnavas. Gaudiya indicating that we are uh, followers of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. In a narrower sense, meaning that we are from Gaura, which means Bengal. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu connected himself to the Madhva Sampradaya. How did he do that? His spiritual master was Ishwar Puri. Ishwar Puri's spiritual master was Madhavendra Puri. And Madhavendra Puri's spiritual master was Lakshmi Pati Tirtha, who was a sannyasi in the Madhva Sampradaya. So it is via Madhavendra Puri and Lakshmi Pati Tirtha that the Gaudiya Sampradaya connects with the Madhva Sampradaya. So in that sense, the Gaudiya Sampradaya can be considered a branch of the Madhva Sampradaya. And yet, there is something very special and distinctive about the Gaudiya Sampradaya and its particular emphasis on the love of Vrindavan and especially the love of the gopis for Vrindavan, which was actually taught and exhibited by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Something very, very unique. So, uh, in one sense, we can say that the Gaudiya Sampradaya is like a fifth Sampradaya. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, being Sri Krishna himself, who has come in the guise of a devotee, from one point of view, he doesn't need to be connected to any sampradaya because he is the Lord himself. One characteristic of a bona fide sampradaya is that it must originate from the Supreme Lord. So because Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is the Supreme Lord, therefore if he starts a sampradaya that is independent of these four, still there would be no fault. It would be bona fide. But nevertheless, because he has come as an acharya, as a teacher, as a spiritual master, as a devotee, Therefore, he pays heed to the words of the scriptures. He does not act in violation of the scriptures. Therefore, he gives deference to the statements of the scriptures that there are these four Vaishnavacharyas, at Sampradayas. And so he connects to one of them. He connected to the Madhva Sampradaya. So one can say that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, one could even call Madhavendra Puri, Ishwar Puri, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and specifically Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is the uh, founder of the Gaudiya Sampradaya. Then the question arises, who is the Sampradaya Acharya? Now, this is a point on which there can be some differences of opinion because of the way we understand the term Sampradaya Acharya. Now, in one sense, any of the Acharyas who appear in our Gaudiya Vaishnava Sampradaya can be called Sampradaya Acharyas. Srila Prabhupada in one place does mention that. You know, in the end of the introduction to Bhagavad Gita as it is, he gives the disciplic succession. And in one talk, in, in one lecture, he mentions that these are the Sampradaya Acharyas. So therefore, in that broad sense, one can understand all these personalities, the prominent gurus in that line, to be Sampradaya Acharyas. All the gurus have not been mentioned in that disciplic succession. Only the prominent ones have been mentioned. And similarly, one can understand that as this succession goes on into the future, and when people a couple of hundred years down the line make the disciplic succession chart, probably not every guru will be on the line. Maybe some of the more prominent ones will be on the line. Who knows how things will go. So anyway, uh, that is one broad understanding of the word Sampradaya Acharya. And in that sense, Srila Prabhupada can be considered the Sampradaya Acharya also, along with the previous Acharyas. Another school of thought is to consider Srila Prabhupada and Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur and Bhakti Vinod Thakur as the Sampradaya Acharyas because of their contributions to the way the Krishna consciousness movement has spread in the modern day and age. That's another understanding. However, uh, it appears to me that it is safer to consider only Rupa Goswami as the Sampradaya Acharya. 
then what about Srila Prabhupada? Because Srila Prabhupada's contributions are so, so extraordinary. It is unprecedented in recent memory for a long time. For several centuries, we have not seen any personality who has spread Krishna consciousness all over the globe. What Srila Prabhupada has done is extremely extraordinary. And therefore, uh, he needs to be remembered in history, not just as one amongst many Acharyas, but he has to be given a certain special place. Now, we have to be careful uh, to ensure that in saying this, we do not in any way minimize the position, the exaltedness and the contributions of those who came before him. So that is very, very important because that will be an enormous version of Aparad for us to do that. So each of these Acharyas have made stellar contributions to the Krishna consciousness movement, starting from uh, right after Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, even before Chaitanya Mahaprabhu actually, and during his time and then after that, the six Goswamis and then Krishnadas Kaviraj Goswami and uh, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, Baladev Vidya Bhushan, etc. So because of Srila Prabhupada's contribution, uh, something special needs to be given to him, some title and that will make him stand out. Even in the midst of all these, uh, you know, personalities who, who have descended from the spiritual world. So therefore, the, the term founder Acharya is significant. Now, in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, Krishnadas Kaviraj Goswami describes what one can call the Chaitanya tree. He says that there are, you know, uh, Madhavendra Puri was the seed, that seed fructified in the form of Ishwar Puri, and there were eight roots, the sannyasis, who were associates of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Mahaprabhu became the trunk of the tree, and then it divided into two parts, Advaita and Nityananda, and then there were other branches of this tree, and the branches uh, had sub-branches, and in this way a huge tree was formed, uh, the tree of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, which has become the Krishna Consciousness Movement. And Srila Prabhupada says that the International Society for Krishna Consciousness is one of the branches of the Chaitanya tree. So, uh, it is under this tree, under this branch, uh, that we are taking shelter. So, we must remember that this branch doesn't exist in isolation. This branch is connected to another branch, which is connected to another branch, which is, which is connected to another one, and ultimately to the main trunk of the Chaitanya tree, which is to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself. So, now, if ISKCON is one branch of the Chaitanya tree, then it must mean that there are many other branches of the Chaitanya tree, even in the present time. So, there are so many followers of the Gaudiya Vaishnava Acharyas. Even amongst the followers of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, there are so many uh, branches and sub-branches. And then even above that. So, uh, we can specifically speak about uh, the ISKCON branch and Srila Prabhupada as the founder Acharya of the ISKCON branch of the Chaitanya tree. And undoubtedly, uh, this branch is the most prominent branch of the Chaitanya tree in the modern era, in our times. Because of sheer spread, because of sheer numbers, because of sheer contribution to the practice and preaching of Krishna consciousness all over the world. So the word founder what does it indicate? It indicates uh, an originator. It indicates um, someone who establishes the institution, the vision, the mission, the standards, the basic teachings, etc. So, 
Therefore, Srila Prabhupada is the founder Acharya of the International Society for, Con uh, for Krishna Consciousness. And the reason it is important to consider this is because uh, the way is called, uh, has been structured by Srila Prabhupada's genius, it is going to perpetuate for many, many, many years. And therefore, down in history, uh, when many centuries have passed, Srila Prabhupada's role will be even more highlighted. And maybe 1,000, 2,000 years from now. So we are talking of something very much in the long term, not just in a couple of years. So Srila Prabhupada's position as founder Acharya, therefore for us, is very important keeping in mind the future. One time when um, the letterhead of ISKCON was being designed and some devotees were writing letters on the ISKCON letterhead without mentioning Srila Prabhupada as a founder Acharya, Srila Prabhupada took exception to that. And he uh, called the devotees concerned and told them that actually you must, whenever you put International Society for Krishna Consciousness on the top of the letterhead, just below that, in smaller letters, you must put Founder Acharya and then Srila Prabhupada's name. So that was a very important point. Now we can Im imagine how difficult internally it must have been for Srila Prabhupada to say that. Because no Vaishnava wants uh, himself or herself to be glorified. Nobody, no Vaishnava wants his or her name to be put up. And no Vaishnava likes to tell people, you must mention my name here, write my name here. Nobody likes that. But as a founder Acharya, who was responsible for the way that his movement would continue for centuries and centuries into the future, it was important that he clarify this point so that there would be no doubt in the future. By establishing this one point, Srila Prabhupada was ensuring that uh, this institution, this branch of the Chaitanya tree would perpetuate and the unity and integrity of this movement would be protected. Why so? Because Srila Prabhupada as a founder Acharya is the one principal central focal point to keep the unity of this branch even though there will be many branches that will come out from this tree from this branch because there are so many devotees who will have their own disciples in later years they will have their disciples so from this one uh, branch of the chaitanya tree called iskon so many sub branches and sub sub branches will emanate so how to keep the integrity and unity of this whole system of, of uh, branches and sub-branches? So that is where the founder Acharya comes in. So this is the reasoning Srila Prabhupada had. He had to ensure that his organization, his institution and the Krishna consciousness movement as he had envisioned it according to the teachings of his Guru Parampara and Mahaprabhu would continue in the long run. So therefore, uh, he emphasized that his name should be there uh, as the founder Acharya. Now, uh, as the founder Acharya, the unity uh, is very important uh, because there is naturally so much of diversity. The diversity that we are seeing now is enormous. So what then to speak of the diversity that will come you know, many, many years later. So, it is Srila Prabhupada around whom this whole institution will, this whole movement will function. And even though I mentioned that there is a distinction between Sampradaya Acharya and Founder Acharya, that the Sampradaya Acharya is Rupa Goswami and Founder Acharya is Khanish Srila Prabhupada, and I talked about the general meanings of Sampradaya Acharya and in which we can also consider Srila Prabhupada's Sampradaya Acharya, there is one more meaning, one more reason why we can also in a general sense call Srila Prabhupada as a Sampradaya Acharya. Consider for example the Madhva Sampradaya. He is a Sampradaya Acharya and even today 
after almost 800 years, uh, the Madhva Sampradaya is strong, it is united, it has its integrity and identity. They have maintained all their teachings and everything and their practices. Why? Because they have kept Madhvachari in the center. If you ask any of the uh, sannyasis of the Madhva Sampradaya, present uh, sannyasis or the previous ones, all of them will invariably speak about Madhvacharya. Even though they will definitely be, uh, you know, at the shelter of their own particular spiritual masters, but they will invariably mention the name of Madhvacharya because that personality is one who is cementing and holding the whole uh, sampradaya together. Similarly with Srila Ramanujacharya. Today also, after more than a thousand years, if you speak to any um, Sri Vaishnava who is knowledgeable, not just to the sannyasis of the Sri Vaishnava Sampradaya, but even to the householders who are sincere practitioners, they will invariably speak about Ramanujacharya. Not that they do not have regard for their own sannyasis or their spiritual masters, they do. They are also surrendered to their own spiritual masters who are also very uh, great Vaishnavas. But Ramanuja has a special place for them. It is Ramanujacharya who has held the Sampradaya together. Now, it is not that Ramanujacharya was the only exalted personality in that Sampradaya. In the Ramanuja Sampradaya, you had the 12 Alvars who are objects of extreme veneration for all Sri Vaishnavas and indeed for all Vaishnavas. Even we as Gaudiya Vaishnavas should revere the Alvars. The word Alvar means intoxicated in love of Godhead. And then there were others like Yamunacharya. And after Ramanuja also, there were many great souls who came. But in spite of that, Ramanuja as a Sampraday Acharya is the one who has held the Sampraday together and will do so in the future as well. So similarly for us, uh, while Rupa Goswami will be the Sampraday Acharya for the Gaudiya Vaishnava Sampraday as a whole, but for the Iskon Sampraday, so to speak, which is a sub Sampraday, or sub discipline succession of the Gaudiya Sampradaya, then Srila Prabhupada is the founder Acharya, and it is around him that the Krishna consciousness movement in ISKCON will function. He will be the focal point, the central point. And if some personality, personality like that is not there, then very quickly the whole Sampradaya will just dissipate, it will all spread. You know, just like a river in a delta. You know what is a delta? When a river approaches a sea, which eventually the water of the river merges into the sea, it will branch off into many, many, many small streams. So it practically loses its identity as that main river. So similarly, uh, devoid of a personality in around whom that sampradaya or disciplic succession primarily focuses, there is a risk that that sampradaya may eventually dissipate, may fragment. So, uh, it is, this is the reason why uh, Prabhupada's role as founder Acharya is so important for the future. We have all heard the phrase, unity in diversity. So, Srila Prabhupada is the one who will maintain the unity. It is not sufficient to say that unity in our Sampraday or in our branch of the Chaitanya tree, ISKCON in the future, will be maintained by keeping Krishna in the center. Yes, that is true. It is necessary to keep Krishna in the center, but not sufficient. Because the understanding of loving Krishna, as given by Srila Prabhupada, is unique. So therefore, not only is it necessary for us to keep Krishna in the center, it is important for us to be united for as many years, for the next 10,000 years. 
Srila Prabhupada mentioned that ISKCON will last for 10,000 years. And then after that, you know, Kali Yuga will come in full force and it will take over. But anyway, 10,000 years may be a short time with respect to a cosmological time scales, but it is a long time compared to our lifetimes. So of only 60, 70, 80 years. So when we speak of keeping this ISKCON movement united for 10,000 years, we are talking of a lot. And if we don't act right now to keep the focus on Srila Prabhupada, then imagine what will happen, not 10,000 years later, but even 25 years later, 50 years, 100 years later. There will be complete fragmentation. So now, if Srila Prabhupada is giving us the unity, and there is unity in diversity, so what are those factors that cause the diversity? What are the potential reasons that could make the society disintegrate of, or become fragmented. So the reasons that diversity exists is because, let's give various possibilities. One is different countries. So, you know, uh, when we are practicing Krishna consciousness in India, is one thing, practicing Krishna consciousness in Japan, in Russia, you know, in some country in Africa, yes, in Europe, South America. So they're all going to be different. There will be some differences there because of the country. Then there will be differences of language because of which diversity exists. There will be differences of culture. And because of culture, many times uh, people do things in a certain way. Uh, sometimes they may be in accordance with uh, Krishna consciousness and sometimes they may not. And sometimes there may be uh, more than one way of doing things in accordance with Krishna consciousness and they may differ according to culture. So people may remain Krishna conscious in one culture and they may also remain Krishna conscious in another culture and where they may do things slightly differently because of their cultural disposition. So because of the cultural, linguistic uh, and regional diversities, there will be a risk that there will be disintegration. But when Srila Prabhupada is in the center, then he is that rope that ties these all together. Then of course, there is the question of different gurus. Yes? So, when Srila Prabhupada was physically present on the planet, uh, he was the only initiating uh, spiritual master within ISKCON. And after him, uh, many other devotees till today are initiating. And they have their disciples. And in future, those disciples will go on to also initiate further. And in that way, the sub-branches and the networks will go on. So even now we see sometimes, and one can be a little honest about it, that sometimes there is some kind of narrow-mindedness amongst devotees who are not very mature. Because of an immature understanding of Krishna consciousness, they tend to make groups based on the Diksha Guru. So we are disciples of such and such Guru and we have our group and we are a special group and we are better than the other groups. So this kind of a, an immature or a neophyte mentality uh, does creep in. It is unfortunately visible sometimes in our movement. And it is visible uh, in various ways. For example, in trying to pull uh, new people to get initiated from their spiritual master, not realizing that actually we must give shiksha to those devotees and eventually inspire them to surrender to Krishna and to Prabhupada and then uh, let them make the choice of whom they want to get initiated from. 
our job is to inspire them in Krishna consciousness to come to Krishna and Prabhupada and to meet the devotees. Then let them take their time, let them think about it deeply, about whom they want to get initiated from. So even now, barely uh, 50 years after the passing of, less than 50 years after the passing of, of Srila Prabhupada, uh, we are seeing signs of that divisiveness coming in. Hmm? Sometimes uh, in our movement we call it Guru Groupism. So whenever we see that rearing its head, we should immediately nip it in the bud. That is not to say that individual devotees should not have relationships with their spiritual masters. Indeed, the disciple's duty is to have full regard and surrender to the instructions of the spiritual master. It is a very holy and sacred relationship which must be preserved in all circumstances. But we must see the distinction between the individual relationship and us existing in an association, in a community of devotees, where there is diversity in terms of spiritual masters. So therefore, when we keep Prabhupada in the focus, then in future also, when the number of spiritual masters will be so very large, it is only Prabhupada that will keep the focus. Just imagine. Now, probably in Iskon we may have, I don't know, maybe 100 gurus, 100, 120, I'm not sure. Imagine a time when there will be, at any given point in time, 200 gurus, 500 gurus, 1000 gurus, yes? And everyone wants to have a group of their guru, separate, something unique. Then what will happen to the institution? So much of petty mindedness will come in. My group, your group, my guru, your guru. So in the neophyte stage, in the immature stage, these things happen. So when we understand the philosophy of Guru Tattva properly, and we understand it is our personal relationship with our guru, and that should not come in the way of us living together in harmony with a larger group of devotees in an institution, and the binding force for that is Srila Prabhupada, then our movement will go along steadily into the future. And apart from this, another cause of um, diversity is just our individual natures and opinions. You know, the nature of, of human beings in this world, uh, the conditioned soul especially, is that if you have you know, two people, you'll have three opinions. You know, everyone has a different opinion on everything, you know. So we have to have some full stop. Who's some, somebody's word is the last word. And that last word has to be Srila Prabhupada's word. Otherwise, we all will in try to enforce our opinion. And our natures are different. So we will try to do things in one way. Somebody else will say, no, no, we should do it in the other way. So what was Srila Prabhupada's way of doing things? Now, of course, there are challenges involved in understanding what it is that Srila Prabhupada wanted and how he did things, which I'll address briefly a little later. But the point here is that we have to have a stable and standard frame of reference, some substratum, a platform in which we can say, yes, this is how we should do things, regardless of what I feel and what you feel regardless of my nature and your nature. So these are some of the factors, there are more as well, these are some of the factors that cause diversity and diversity potentially can cause disintegration, therefore we must bring in unity in that diversity. So now we did mention some of the ways in which Srila Prabhupada uh, being in the center can keep unity. But specifically, let's examine this a little more. What are the specific ways in which understanding Srila Prabhupada as a founder Acharya and keeping him in the center of our movement will indeed ensure the unity and integrity of our movement? Number one, it is Srila Prabhupada's books that are the basis. 
Now what do the books contain? The books contain his teachings. They contain the theology, the principles of Krishna consciousness, and also the uh, elaboration on the practice of Krishna conscious principles and practice both together make the philosophy and the culture as well. So Srila Prabhupada's books give us the entire culture of Krishna consciousness, which includes the theology, the philosophy, the practice, the principles, you know, the broader do's and don'ts of life. So everything is there. So the books are the basis. So this central point uh, is the books because they have the teachings. And Srila Prabhupada's books, if they are kept as that main central focus, then it will ensure that the teachings remain standard and uh, unchanging throughout the times. There will be consistency. That is one difference between uh, spiritual knowledge and material knowledge. <clears throat> material knowledge keeps changing. Spiritual knowledge cannot change. Krishna will always remain the Supreme Personality of Godhead even 5,000 years into the future or 100,000 years into the future. So everything that Srila Prabhupada has taught, the basic principles of theology and will remain the same always. So if that is not done, if we do not keep Srila Prabhupada's books as the standard, then tomorrow somebody else will come with some kind of new teaching and say, well, this is what we should be following. And that is actually how the upper sampradayas formed. You know what are upper sampradayas? Uh, upper sampradayas are those uh, groups that deviated from the main sampradaya or the teachings of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur at his time identified about 12 or 13 of them. <clears throat> like Aula, Baula, <clears throat> Karta, Bhaja, Prakrita, Sahajiya, <clears throat> etc. Et <clears throat> so each of these upper sampradayas, the deviant sects, they branched off from the Gaudiya Sampradaya. They personally consider themselves Gaudiya Vaishnavas, but actually speaking, they have deviated from the teachings of Mahaprabhu in one or more respects. The Sahajiyas de deviate in some respect. The Prakrita Sahajiyas, uh, I mean the uh, uh, Jati Gosais deviate in another respect. So they have taken something from the teachings of Mahaprabhu and twisted it and presented something else and they claim to be bona fide followers. So unless we have the standard books, which will be our frame of reference, there will be danger of upper sampradayas forming in the future as well. Even now we see tendencies of that happening. For example, this whole Ritvik philosophy and the Ritvik guru idea, you know, that is it's like an upper sampradaya. Yes, the idea that Srila Prabhupada will be the only Diksha guru for all generations to come. It is not supported by Srila Prabhupada's teachings. Nowhere has Srila Prabhupada said that he shall remain the Diksha Guru for everyone who comes henceforth in the history of Iskon or in the future of Iskon. So this is a deviation. So when we talk of keeping Prabhupada in the center and having him as a central unifying force, we must make sure we don't, the momentum of that doesn't take us forward to the extreme that makes us deviate from the teachings. So keeping Srila Prabhupada's books in the center, his teaching, this is the first <clears throat> and most important way by which Srila Prabhupada uh, uh, will be the founder Acharya of ISKCON. So his books will be our basis. Many followers of Srila Prabhupada down the generations will write their own books. Already many devotees have, are writing books. They have written several books. And in future also they will write many, many more books. But ultimately, 
they will all be based on the teachings of Srila Prabhupada and his books. So this is the first point of how the founder Acharya, the books of the founder Acharya will be the basis. So this is one implication of uh, the Prabhupada being the founder Acharya for the future and how he will maintain the unity. The second is the institution that Srila Prabhupada formed, ISKCON. Now, Srila Prabhupada said many times that he is non-different from ISKCON, that ISKCON is his body. So the institution uh, has its importance. You know, like everything else in this world, we must have a balanced understanding of the institution. Just like I was speaking about having a balance about the position of Srila Prabhupada, and when we start promoting Srila Prabhupada as a founder Acharya, it is not that we go to the extreme of saying that he and he alone will be the Diksha Guru for the rest of the next 10,000 years. We, can't, we have to keep that balance. Similarly, when we understand the importance of the institution of ISKCON, we must keep that balance. We must not become so bureaucratic and so institutionalized that we forget the very purpose of the institution. The purpose of the institution is that it should facilitate everyone to become pure devotees. One time Srila Prabhupada said that the purpose for which he founded ISKCON was to give the association of devotees to the people of this world. A very succinct definition of the reason why Srila Prabhupada formed ISKCON. Now, I want to introduce two words which I speak about sometimes uh, when we are speaking on similar topics. And I don't remember if I have mentioned this to uh, any lecture I gave in Bhaktivedanta Manor, but even if, it, if I have, it's still worth repeating it. There are two um, words that I would like to introduce. One is called Sangha. G-H. Sangha. And the other is called Sangha. Only G-A. No H. Now the two words sound similar. And they are interrelated. But they are different words. They mean different things. The word Sangha means a group, a community, an organization, a, 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 an institution. Hmm? So that is a Sangha. Actually in, uh, in Hindi, the International Society for Krishna Consciousness is translated as Antarashtriya Shri Krishna Bhavnamrit Sangha. So Sangha means a society or an institution. Okay, so uh, now let's come back to Prabhupada's uh, reason for why he founded ISKCON. To give association of devotees to the people of the world. What is the word association of devotees called? Or word association in Sanskrit? Sangha. So the purpose of the Sangha is to give Sangha. I hope that is clear. Sangha is meant for Sangha, Satsangha. If the Satsangha is not there, if inside the Sangha there is Asatsangha, then that Sangha will become also Asatsangha. It will become a false institution. So to keep that institution pure, to keep it focused on the basics, on the principles, to keep it moving in the right direction, to maintain the proper standards, the institution has to be run in a certain way. It has to be structured in a certain way. Now, if we take an extreme view, either side, that is not good. One extreme will be that, you know, the um, Sangha is everything. 
and I will just simply focus so much on the institution that I will forget the people, the devotees who are within. I will forget that I have to become a pure devotee. Why have why has this con been made? We forget that. And it's just about the institution. Then we become a bureaucratic institution. On the other extreme is to be dismissive of the institution and say, oh, we are just chanting Hare Krishna. There's no need for institution. So we have to keep in mind that that is also not a correct understanding because Srila Prabhupada himself set up the institution. And he set up the institution because he knew that this was the way forward to safeguard his movement and safeguard the integrity and purity of his teachings. So all our acharyas in the past, whether it's Madhvacharya, Ramanujacharya, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, they all formed Sanghas. Even if you look at others, Buddha, Buddha also had his Sangha, although it may not have been so, uh, shall we say, formally structured at that time. You know? Even today, the Buddhists, they will say, you know, Dhammam Sharanam Gachami, Sangham Sharanam Gachami. You know, Dhamma, Dhamma means a Dharma. So they will say, I am going to surrender to my Dharma. Or they will say, Sangham Sharanam Gachami. So I am going to surrender to my Sangha, the Buddhist Sangha. You know, so for them, the Dhamma or the Dharma and the Sangha was one. So when we understand the pure purpose of the institution and we keep that purity and that connection very strong to its purpose, then that institution is non-different from Prabhupada and non-different from Krishna. And for such an institution, we have to surrender to it. So it is our duty to uh, maintain the integrity of that institution. So institution means there has to be a structure, there has to be a hierarchy. Without that, there is no question of an institution. So Srila Prabhupada, he did not want an Acharya after him <clears throat> because he saw what happened to his god brothers. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur wanted um, a governing body commission, a committee to be formed after him. He did not want to appoint uh, another Acharya after him, but somehow or the other, after his departure from this world, uh, such a GBC was not formed. Fortunately, uh, in ISKCON that has not happened, because Srila Prabhupada, in his physical presence on the planet, established the Governing Body Commission for ISKCON. And he oversaw its functioning for a few years. So that by the time he departed, you know, the GBC was already a functioning body. In this way, Srila Prabhupada was a genius following the footsteps of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. He ensured that the institution would perpetuate. Those with only uh, individual acharyas, you never know what will happen tomorrow. But when there is a body, then it maintains. So there is greater stability, greater security with having this. The risks are also there, of course. So in this way, Srila Prabhupada, as the founder Acharya, has ensured that ISKCON will survive in the future. Actually, what to speak of the future, had it not been for uh, such an institutional structure that he set up, even in the 40, 45, 50 years since his departure, we would already have disintegrated. <laughs> <laughs> what to speak of going many centuries later. If you look at many other organizations, even spiritual organizations, they all crumble within a short time after the disappearance of the founder. But Srila Prabhupada's organization will perpetuate because of the institutional structure that he gave it. Not just the GBC, but then also the other things along with the GBC that go with it the different zones and the temples and the temple president and secretary, treasurer, different bodies running the temples. So there is a whole network, a tree network. Uh, in this way, uh, the founder Acharya, Srila Prabhupada is a founder Acharya. 
has set up the institution and he is the founder acharya of this institution that is why it is so important his role as founder acharya for the future and that is why he insisted that in every letter head in every communication uh, below is con international society for krishna consciousness you must have founder acharya and shri prabhupad's name so this is the second point in which the founder acharya is necessary uh, from the point of view of preserving his con in the future the third point is the kind of activities and mood that shila prabhupad uh, taught and instructed and in that he gave certain emphasis to so many things for example he emphasized the spirit of preaching one of the reasons for sanatan dharma in general uh having kind of dissipated or watered become watered down is because of the lack of the preaching spirit the preaching spirit keeps the movement alive and dynamic and vigorous and energetic and it brings in fresh blood it brings in vitality keeps everybody inspired and motivated so shila prabhupad he emphasized preaching and in that preaching he gave us many many tools or or different ways in which to preach for example the distribution of books never before uh had the distribution of books taken place on this scale people out in the streets going out airports bus stations in the shops in the homes in the streets everywhere then harinam sankirtan going out in the streets chanting the holy names organizing programs and lectures everywhere universities homes different other public forums then temple construction you know scientific preaching he set up the bhakti vidanta institute he set up the bbt for publishing so and his mood was also a very very pragmatic very broad minded very inclusive he included everybody the whole world so therefore from lilamrita prabhupad lilamrita you know the phrase that shila prabhupad built a house in which the whole world could live that shows his broad mindedness shila prabhupad did not discriminate uh, according to any of the factors that caused diversity that we saw earlier whether they were from different countries or languages or ethnicities or cultures or whatever for shila prabhupada they were all equal and he uh, kept this mood of of giving krishna consciousness to one and all so his mood his missionary zeal the kind of activities that he promoted are also unique as a founder acharya he set up that system set up those type of activities which we will perpetuate so that is his third important contribution as founder acharya which has to continue in the future for the perpetuation of his con and finally i just like to make one point which is the connection to the sampradaya or the parampara now here again we come to the point of guru tatva a little bit um yes there is diksha and there is shiksha so we take diksha from a, a diksha guru who has himself taken diksha from another diksha guru within the movement and that's how the whole structure is now imagine uh, 500 years down the line and consider the situation of the altar of an iskon temple okay <laughs> just imagine what is there on the altar of an iskon temple today you have the deities and you have tulsi maharani you have lord narsingh dev's picture you have the panchatatva picture apart from the deities of wood or metal or whatever then you have a picture of the uh, six goswamis painting and then you have the guru parampara so who do you have in the guru parampara 
it starts from Jagannath Das Babaji. At least. So we cannot omit Jagannath Das Babaji. Then Shri Bhakti Vinod Thakur. Then Gaur Kishor Das Babaji Maharaj. Then Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. And then Srila Prabhupada. It ends there. When you keep on the altar. All Iskon temples are supposed to have only uh, these personalities on their altar. When the Pujari comes on the altar to do Arati, uh, then the Pujari will additionally bring the photograph of his Diksha Guru, which he will keep on the table where, where the Arati paraphernalia is placed. Then he or she will do the Arati, and uh, because the spiritual master is also there, and then when the Arati is over, the Pujari will take the photograph of his or her uh, Diksha Guru and go inside. It will be kept behind in the Pujari room. But in the altar, you have only up to Srila Prabhupada. Now, why so? Just imagine, it's not hard to understand. 500 years down the line, <laughs> how many Diksha Gurus would have been there for any person till Prabhupada? So between any particular devotee 500 years from now who takes initiation, how many Diksha Gurus will be there between that devotee and Prabhupada? So is it possible to put all those Gurus there on the altar? It's not possible, right? There may be so many Gurus, uh, you know, uh, who are very exalted also in that parampara, but you just cannot keep, there is no, there is no space and it's just not practical. So therefore, the only logical thing to do is to keep the altar in the temple as it is today, with the founder Acharya's picture as the last picture of the Guru Parampara, from Jagannath Das Babaji down to Srila Prabhupada. And then when the Pujari comes, you know, the picture of that Pujari's Diksha Guru will be there, which will be taken away. Otherwise, it will cause chaos. Hmm? So, in this way, we see why the, the implications of the word founder Acharya. This is one of the meanings of it, that he becomes the prominent link to the Sampradaya. It's not that, uh, you know, uh, there is no significance to the Gurus after him. No, that's very important, as I mentioned. We shouldn't go to one extreme or to the other extreme. So, therefore, uh, the Diksha Parampara, the Shiksha Parampatra through which we are connected to Srila Prabhupada will retain its sanctity, will retain its importance and significance. And that should not be lost. But then from Prabhupada, that connection, when the devotee is worshipping, the Diksha Guru will be there and then Prabhupada. Hmm? In this way, for the next 10,000 years, the system can go on. So this, and that is why uh, we have the system of uh, Guru Puja in the temple every day. Whose Guru Puja do we do? Srila Prabhupada's Guru Puja. Imagine again, even today, what to speak of 500 years from now. There are devotees in the temple who may have, you know, so many different Diksha Gurus. If everybody says we will have Diksha Guru Puja of our Diksha Guru, <laughs> just imagine what will happen in the temple. There will be chaos even now. What to speak of many, many years later. So therefore, the idea is only the founder Acharya will be worshipped. Officially, formally, devotedly, in the temple hall, in every ISKCON temple, and in every ISKCON program. So this is one of the other implications of Srila Prabhupada being the founder Acharya, that he becomes a prominent link, the connecting link to the Sampradaya and the Parampara for us, without in any way compromising the contribution that the later Gurus will have in connecting any devotee to the Sampradaya. So there could be so many other points that uh, one can speak about, but these are broadly speaking four, uh, shall we say, uh, points in which I would say Prabhupada is a founder Acharya of ISKCON um, plays a role for the future of ISKCON. Now the question comes of 
uh, having differences of amongst ourselves, even though we accept all these points. We accept Prabhupada's teachings. Everything that we've discussed now, we accept. But still, we may differ on what Prabhupada means when he says a certain thing. There could be differences of opinion about what Prabhupada wanted in a particular type of situation. There may be differences of opinion on that. Even the scripture does not talk about every possible situation that we can encounter in life. That's, it's an important point. What does the Shastra give us? The Shastra gives us basic principles and it gives us some examples to illustrate those principles. But it cannot possibly give us, you know, all possible situations because there will be an unlimited number of such situations. So similarly, Srila Prabhupada also has given us teachings, he has given us principles, he has uh, given us how to deal with certain situations, but he, he has not given us every possible situation for the foreseeable and unforeseeable future. So we will have differences amongst ourselves as a whole movement with regard to theological issues, with regard to issues of how to apply that principle or those principles to uh, you know, contemporary situations, etc. And that is where our sincerity, our understanding, our humility, our sense of cooperation, you know, will come into the picture. If we are all surrendered to Srila Prabhupada and we understand the need for perpetuating this institution in its purity, then somehow or the other, in a Vaishnava-like mood, we have to come together for Srila Prabhupada's pleasure to uh, settle these differences and come to some unified, consensual understanding of the way forward, which will be in accordance with Guru Sadhu Shastra. Hmm. So, uh, these are some of the possibilities and we see that happening now as well. But imagine, even with Srila Prabhupada being the founder Acharya, even with all of us accepting him as a founder Acharya, still there are issues. So if we didn't have Prabhupada as a founder Acharya, just imagine what would have happened. So, uh, oh, I've gone quite a bit, uh, almost one hour, 20 minutes, I think. Sorry, I just um, went on. I got carried away speaking so many things. So, Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, anyway, so this is, as I understand, uh, there could be other things that could be said as well, but because we have limited time, I've restricted myself to this on the importance of Srila Prabhupada as the founder Acharya for the future of ISKCON. So I think I'll stop here uh, because we may have to leave some time for uh, questions as well. Do we have time for questions? Yes. Okay, so the question is, uh, how can future generations stay connected to Srila Prabhupada? Right? Uh, by staying connected to his sincere, dedicated followers. That's the bottom line. And who are his sincere, dedicated followers? Those who study and apply the teachings of his books in their lives. They study those books, they hear about those books and they apply them in their life. Those who cooperate with the uh, systems that he has set up, those who align with his mood. So basically, uh, reading his books, hearing his books, following Srila Prabhupada's Vani or his teachings and associating with his sincere followers. That is the best way to keep connected to Srila Prabhupada.
how to give Srila Prabhupada's philosophy to the family who feel they know, so they don't need to be told. Well, you know, you can't force people to accept things. And we should not try to force people to accept what we say. But we should try to encourage them, inspire them by the way we act and the way we give Krishna consciousness to them. If we set a good example ourselves, then uh, they will be much more inclined to listen to us than if we simply try to uh, push it down into their life. You must do this, you must do that. So we must try to set such a good example that they will say, oh yeah, being a devotee is so nice actually, that see he, he or she is behaving in such a nice way, I would like to listen to what they have to say. Well, uh, it's a difficult situation. Uh, I think all of us who are not living there, we can pray for devotees there that they can continue with enthusiasm and determination. And uh, the prayers of the devotees, I'm sure, will be heard by Krishna who will then empower them and facilitate them. So to this devotee, I will say that we are all praying for you, all of us. And we hope that Krishna will indeed do all that is necessary to help you and your fellow devotees there. Do not become discouraged. Um, consider this as an opportunity for you and your fellow devotees there to become even more surrendered to Krishna. Practice uh, more sincerely and preach in a way that, um, shall we say, is compatible with your situation there so that you do not get into too much trouble and uh, and Krishna will empower you. Do not become discouraged. You see, uh, okay, the question is that this is a small girl who's asking the question, 13 years old. I'm repeating the question because there are others on other platforms who are attending also. And that Krishna says that he gives everything but does not take it away, then why does he take away our body and other things? Well, Krishna certainly gives everything, but he never says he doesn't take away. On the contrary, he says he will take away everything. Uh, and the body certainly. So everything in this world must come to an end. So Krishna, through the time factor, through the laws of material nature, will take away everything. But he will not take away our bhakti. He will only nurture, nourish and encourage our bhakti and, and make it uh, grow further. So the really important thing, our bhakti, that he will not take away, that he will increase. Other things he can take, he can give, he can do whatever he likes. Okay, so the question is that how does one bring about a consensus between those who have different approaches to the practice of Krishna consciousness, particularly when it comes to preaching, uh, some with the traditional uh, viewpoint and some with a more, shall we say, modern viewpoint. Well, let's look at it this way. There will always be um, such a variety existing in any group. You know, there will be those who are a little more conservative. There will be more those who are a little more liberal. It's always going to happen. There will be some who are in the center, some who are excessively liberal, some who are excessively conservative. You know, it takes all types to make a world. There's infinite variety in the spiritual world as there is in the material world. So amongst devotees also, we will find this variety. The reasons for the variety are also numerous. One has to do with one's own cultural uh, background and upbringing. Another has to do with the kind of association one has. Another to do with the kind of environment in which one is preaching. Another has to do with the way one understands, uh, you know, best how they think that uh, Krishna consciousness needs to be practiced. So we cannot eliminate the differences in outlook. 
I don't think it is possible. And to some degree, perhaps it is not desirable also. Some variety is essential, it will be there. We cannot paint everybody with one brush. I don't think we should be afraid of differences of opinion. Because that is bound to happen. Even in, in the spiritual world, there is a difference of opinion. But the point is how we reconcile these differences of opinion. Are we doing it in a Vaishnava-like manner? Or are we doing it uh, in a way that is not, uh, shall we say, compatible uh, with Vaishnava spirit, with Vaishnava etiquette? Hmm? So we must follow the Vaishnava etiquette in trying to resolve differences. Ultimately, I can say, even amongst very dedicated and senior and uh, you know knowledgeable devotees, when there are such uh, differences, sometimes it seem to be almost intractable. Uh, one can only see that as Krishna's arrangement for some reason. But uh, we have to try to ensure that we do it amicably. Uh, we have to see this as an opportunity that Krishna is giving us. It's a challenge to enable us to work together in a humble spirit, sacrificing our ego and try to come to some understanding and, and be broad enough to understand another's point of view and concerns. So it is an opportunity for us to go deeper into Vaishnava ways of dealing with each other and also of understanding things more deeply. So there is no perfect answer to this. It is not possible to, at a practical level, resolve these things. This type of, this type of thing has always existed, you know, in, in the devotional. It's not something very new. Uh, so it will be there. But uh, we should approach this in a true Vaishnava-like manner. Then Krishna will be pleased with us and he will uh, bring out some proper solution to everything. But we have to be very Krishna conscious for that. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you all very much and I once again, hope and pray that you will all remain healthy and safe in the midst of this pandemic. And I pray that the uh, devotional activities of Bhaktivedanta Manor will continue to grow and flourish. And all of you will contribute more and more and make Srila Prabhupada and Radha Gokulananda uh, very happy. So thank you for the opportunity to be with all of you. Your temple is a source of great inspiration to many devotees all around the world. You have a wonderful community there. And I hope and pray that I will be able to get your association sometime soon when this pandemic eases up. So thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Gaur Premanande Hari Hari Bol. I see Vishakha Mataji here. Hare Krishna Vishakha Mataji. I hope you are well. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you.